Hi there, I'm Ashley Burns with DAV, and today I am joined by DAV member and retired Marine First Sergeant John Bernard. So we're going to be talking about something that I know is forever etched in John's heart and, and truth be told mine as well. We're talking about stories of America's military veterans uh, during 9-11. And while there are countless stories uh, of those who were serving during that time, uh, or enlisted as a result of the attacks on 9-11, I don't think you can really tell that whole story without talking about the men and women who were also lost in Afghanistan in the 20 years since that day. Uh, so John is with us today. Uh, he is a Gulf War veteran. He also lost a son, uh, Josh Bernard, in 2009 in Afghanistan. But I want to take it back to 9-11 and start the story there. Uh, John, can you tell me a little bit about your recollection from the day of the attacks? Uh, so I was in the reserves uh, and I was working on a mountain in Maine uh, when we got the word that the uh, that a plane had hit uh, the first tower. And uh, one member of the crew that was there came around the corner and told me that. And my first reaction was, well, you got two great big sticks, you know, standing up in the air. It was just a matter of time for a plane hit it. You know, uh, a plane had hit the uh, the Empire State Building back in the I think the 30s. So uh, it was not unusual to me. Uh, a few minutes later, he came back around the corner and he said, "A, a plane hit the hit the second top. It's, it's a terrorist attack." And every head on the job site within hearing turned at that point turned to me. And uh, everybody just stopped, stopped working. And they all asked the same question. How can you possibly know it's a terrorist attack? And of course, then there were the following phone calls and were meetings. And as we were trying to try to figure out, you know, who was going to be called up, who was going to go where, when, you know, what the missions were going to look, you know, going to look like. And, uh, but that's, that's my recollection anyway, is, is uh, uh, being on that job site and having all of these people around uh, that had no clue that something like that could happen. You know, John, as you mentioned, your father was a Marine uh, and you were very young when you first decided you wanted to become a Marine as well. I think there's something very, very special about legacy military families like yours. You know, the military is sort of contagious in a way for those who live in service. Um, you know, you, you see those people that you love and respect and admire and you want to follow in their footsteps. So what was it? like for you when you found out that Josh was going to be part of that legacy? What was your reaction? Maybe foolishly, callously, naively. Um, when you start to realize that your son or daughter is going to join the core, um, you're kind of proud of that. It's like, you know, that's, that just seemed like the natural thing. Uh, I, I, I personally never gave a thought in all of the years that I was in, including the Gulf, uh, never gave a, a, just a second thought to my safety. It just, it's just has not been an issue. So when Josh mentioned he wanted to join the Corps, uh, that thought initially didn't, it just wasn't there. I was not concerned at that point. So uh, I, was, I was proud that he did, you know, he'd made the decision. My big concern was that he was making this, you know, the decision for himself and not in some kind of uh, sense of, you know, duty to family that he must follow in, you know, my footsteps or something. So the, there, there was no, no angst, no concern at that point. Uh, that didn't ramp up in me until, uh, until his second deployment to Afghanistan. His first was to Iraq and uh, we knew kind of knew what the conditions were and the limitations of trouble and whatever, uh, kind of knew what the mission was. And uh, so I was, you know, other than just keeping in close contact with as best we could, um, I had no overt concern. Uh, that concern didn't come in until we found out that their second rotation was going to be to the Hellman. And uh, we, I, cause I'd been keeping close tabs on, on the nation at that point. And, uh, and, with the realization that they had just, you know, changed a strategy and he was going to be leaving right on the heels of that. So uh, uh, then, then I became you know, concerned. So on August 14th, 2009, 
uh, 12 years exactly to the day prior to the US um, beginning evacuations out of Afghanistan, Josh was killed in action. Uh, he was just shy of his 22nd birthday. Even as a Marine yourself, no parent can ever really be prepared for that moment. But can you share with me your initial reactions to learning that he'd been hit and perhaps even how that evolved over the days and weeks that followed as your family processed that news? We had gotten a call from him on a Wednesday. They were just getting ready to mount out on an operation uh, outside of the main Nalzad area into a small hamlet called Dehena. And uh, they had uh, decided that as best they could in areas where we were working, uh, that they would go into the, uh, the, the towns and the hamlets, the villages that, you know, and wherever the polling booths were, uh, that we would um, do one of two things, either guard those polling booths, or if there was a presence there that, that was torturing the population, that we would go through and clear those areas. So Dehena had a, uh, a cluster uh, of Taliban and they wanted to get, get them out of there. And so they got, uh, Gulf Company got, got the mission and uh, he called me on Wednesday and said, hey dad, he says, uh, there's something coming, he says, and it's gonna be bad. And there was a significant change in his voice. Um, and uh, I don't know if it was premonition or he was prepping me or whatever. Um, of course, the problem for me was that, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be the supportive dad slash first sergeant still and, uh, and, and not really acknowledging what he was trying to say, I think. Um, and uh, I, I didn't blow it off. I, I, I was encouraging him, look, you, you know your you know your job. You know, you you you've got you've got better skills than anybody, you know. Just keep your head on straight, you know, just do what you do what you do, you know, and you'll be fine. Uh, over the next day or two days, uh, we got word that uh, you know that they had pretty much um, to listen to the news, they'd completed the mission. It was like the mission was over, you know? And it was just a matter of hours later, and we'd gone to the job site, get in the truck, go home. Uh, I went to the house. My daughter, my, actually my daughter was working with me at the time, but dropped her off. And I walked over to the shop. And uh, then I, I hear a panic uh, uh, call from my wife and my daughter uh, coming up the road. And, uh, and it, I, I didn't know what had happened. I mean, typically you think, well, somebody died, you know, somebody got hurt. And, uh, but it still hadn't crossed my mind. It could be Josh um, because we were seeing that everything was, was done, you know? And uh, so I, I look up the road and sure enough, I see the Keiko coming up. And uh, so uh, it, it, it's interesting. I, I literally fell to my knees. I, I was, you know, in that, that instant. I know what that was. So, uh, of course, there's a whole battery of questions, yeah. It's got to be some kind of a mistake. I mean, we just heard everything was clear, you know, but uh, over the days, I mean, I did, did a bunch of research and got a chance to talk to the leadership and uh, talk to the guys that were actually in the patrol and uh, found out that uh, they had pushed through. There was, there were elements, you know, there's, it, somebody's flanking somebody when you push them through something like that. And uh, somebody had called an administrative hold, you know, who knows why, I mean, probably, probably they don't, nobody there will remember why, but it usually has to do with, with you know, just, just making sure that units are where they're supposed to be and you're not gonna wind up in a friendly fire situation or, you just just for control, you know. But the point was that when they stopped, they were in a danger zone, and the uh, patrol leader immediately reached for the handhook and uh, to say, "Hey, you, 
we, we, we have to displace, we can't stay here, you know? And, uh, excuse me, one of the locals had, uh, had already approached them and said, look, we know the bad guys are essentially, you know? And uh, so they knew that they were heading into something. Uh, they just didn't know what it was. And, uh, but before he could even make the call, they got a barrage of rockets and uh, just took a direct hit. As we all watch the situation unfolding in Afghanistan, especially so close to the anniversary of, of Josh's death, um, I just really couldn't help but think of you and your family. I know it's it's difficult for a lot of people to process, um, Afghanistan veterans in particular, other generations of veterans as well, but as they, they come to grips with the people that they've lost and the contributions that they've made and what that means in the scope of this entire war. Um, but watching this, how do you view Josh's service in the context of what's, what's happened in Afghanistan and in the context really of this entire 20 year conflict since 9-11? The reality is that as Marines, uh, we don't get to select our wars. We don't get to uh, criticize orders. Uh, we don't get to uh, scrutinize uh, you know, uh, orders or, or campaigns or uh, whatever is coming down from wherever it's coming down from. Uh, basically, you get what you get. If you're going to go back and you're going to complain, you complain to somebody that you can use as a sounding board uh, who's probably thinking the same thing you are. But the reality is you go out and you do your mission. It's as simple as that. Uh, and you do your mission understanding that there could be uh, a heavy toll. You know, um, If you're wise enough, you're also doing an understanding that it could be for naught. So my guidance to the guys was, look, uh, you're right. This thing was lost, but it wasn't lost today. It was lost 12 years ago. It was a determination made to not win that whatever it is that they're, they're struggling with is not on them, you know, to not take personal, because that's, that's where most of this comes from. Survivor's guilt or, or you know, geez, if I'd only made one step further or I'd made a different decision, so-and-so would still be here, you know? Uh, and you can't do that to yourself. You just can't, you, I mean, if you're gonna do that, do you, I guess you'll spend a whole life doing that because that life is filled with those, those experiences. But trying to tell them, you know, don't do that. Don't don't take responsibility for the things that it's it, things that are not yours to carry. You know, and and the reality is this: every human being that's ever been born and ever will be born is going to die. We don't know what that's going to look like or when. You know, uh, but to say that you know, my son at twenty two was robbed of his entire life, it's kind of the wrong way of looking at it. He lived his entire life. His entire life was 22 years. It's not what we would have wanted, but that was his entire life. And he lived it, and he lived it well. So the, the Marines from his unit, clearly family and friends, um, probably folks from his hometown, they hold Josh's memory very close to their hearts. Um, how do you and your family honor Josh, and what do you hope that his legacy is from those 22 years? Well, his legacy is, in fact, those, those, the way those people remember him and, and the high regard that they, they hope, you know, they, they keep the way they regard him. So, and, and every, every time you get a note, I mean, that, that's his legacy. It's a, almost like a living legacy, you know? I mean, you can, I, I got, I wish you could see it. I've got a, uh, a bust over here that a, uh, a, a Marine friend of mine in Florida, that's what he does. He does busts of, of guys that have been killed. And uh, he and I met based on that. He wanted to do a bust of Josh. And, and uh, uh, we actually met in Virginia and picked up the, the bust from him. You know, um, that's, that's what he does. You know, uh, there, there are paintings all over the place um, of people that have done everything from uh, charcoal hand, you know, drawings to more elaborate paintings to um, just all sorts of things. Uh, somebody ran the uh, the Marine Corps Marathon, uh, and then brought, it actually put everything related to that for that run, including the T-shirt he had made, into a uh, sort of a shadow box and presented that to us. You know, uh, the Marshal Service, 
were so taken with the, the fact that Josh had said he'd like to be a marshal, uh, they made him an honorary marshal, which uh, they were quite clear that we've only done this just, just a handful of times in the whole history of the marshal service, you know? So uh, it, it's not those things, but it's the impression that, that created those things. So that's his legacy. Uh, from our standpoint, his, his family, uh, I, knowing Josh, um, the best way that we can honor him is to keep him normal. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense or not, but uh, we don't have to you know, run up and down the street with banners and, and plaques and, and things like that and say, you know, you know, Joshua Bernard lived here and, it, you know, this is the car that Josh drove in and whatever. Um, we live with his memory all the time. Uh, whenever these conversations come up, there's ample opportunity to talk about it. But he was a pretty quiet kid. And uh, he, he would be shaking his head, I, I'm sure, a every single time there was a discussion about him, and especially with anybody speaking of him in, in grander terms, he would just be like, you guys talking about, you know, um, that he was not, there was no element of him that was looking or even, even considered himself like that. So he would be very shocked, you know? So we honor his memory by living. 